Okay, so this is chapter four, part three. He was confused by so many impressions that he could not grasp anything properly at first. The house was full of things and there were women in black dresses and white aprons who must be maids. And there was a very beautiful woman who turned out to be the children's mother and she laughed and cried almost in the same breath and it was very difficult to escape her caresses. And then they phoned for a doctor and David said he would like to wash, but they would not let him, not before the doctor had been there, they said, for he must not get water on his burns. And it was no use David saying he did not think he was very badly burned. <clears throat> Then the doctor came and said David was right. Maria had come to no harm at all because David had carried her so quickly through the fire. David could thank the thick soles of his feet, he said, that he had gotten off so lightly from his act of heroism. He was a little burned about his hands and arms and legs, but it would not be long before he recovered. David knew that doctors were good men. They were never allowed inside the camp, and the other prisoners had always told him that doctors were there to help people when they were ill. So he submitted quietly while the doctor touched him and wiped the dirt away with something from a bottle. It hurt all the time, and then the doctor put something else on his burns, and that hurt too. But the doctor explained that if he did not do it, the burns would be more painful the next day. David must just go to sleep now, and then he would feel better when he woke up again. The doctor was right too. David did feel better. He felt fine, in fact, although his hands were still rather painful. He opened his eyes and remembered that he was lying in a bed. He shifted his position slightly, but the bed still felt cozy and wonderfully soft. He sat up to see what it was like, and the bed gave under his weight and bounced gently under him. So that was what a bed was. A big box on legs made of dark, polished wood with pillows and sheets. Yes, it was going to be the most interesting to see what a house looked like, and he thought of all the words he would now be able to use. He knew many words he had never used because he was afraid that, not knowing the things they referred to, he might use them wrongly and show his ignorance. Besides, he would have felt silly saying words without really knowing what they meant. Sheets. Imagine sleeping every night in a soft bed like this, where you did not feel cold, and between soft white sheets where you knew everything around you was perfectly clean. <clears throat> He continued gazing at the sheets for a while longer. He was itching with impatience to examine the room and everything in it, but there was something he had to attend to first. He had learned what happiness meant, and he had found out how to smile without even practicing in a mirror. That was a very important thing, much more important than the bed, for he could not take that with him. But the other, that would stay with him wherever he went. Johannes had taught him always to remember to say thank you. <clears throat> he had been to people, of course, and he had been very strict about it. He had insisted upon David saying thank you even to them, when they gave him food, for example, David had not wanted to, not to them. But Johannes had said, politeness is something you owe other people because when you show a little courtesy, everything becomes easier and better. But first and foremost, it's something you owe yourself. You are David. And if you never allow other people to influence what you're really like, then you've something no one can take from you, not even they. Never mind what others are like. You must still be David. Do you understand what I mean? David had not said yes right away, for Johannes would always have to think him carefully first would always have to think him carefully first and not answer until he understood what he was saying. But afterward, David had realized something of what Johannes had meant, especially when a short time later there appeared in the camp an inspector who thought David might know something about Johannes. The boy knows nothing, the man had said, and he had been right, of course. But if he had known anything they wanted to find out, he would still have done his best to say nothing, even if they had offered him extra food to talk. And even though Johannes would never have scolded him for doing it, he would have tried to keep silent not because of anything other people might say or do, but simply because he was David and he was Johannes' friend. After that, he had always said thank you when he was given food, not to make them think he did not hate them, but so that they could see he was polite because he wanted to be. And if you wanted to be polite to people, even to them, then you must remember to be polite to God. It would not take more than a minute and he could examine the room afterward. David stared ahead at the sheet, hard at the sheet, so that nothing in the room could, should distract his attention. And then he said quickly, God of the green pastures and the still waters, I want to thank you because I've learned about happiness and found out how to smile. And thank you too for being pleased I rescued the girl for you. I hope I can find something different to do for you next time because this was very difficult and I was very frightened of the fire. And so I would rather not do anything like that too often. Will you please let it do, let it do for the next three times I may need you to help me? I am David, amen. As soon as he had said amen, he was out of bed. On the floor was a large patterned carpet, soft and cozy to walk on. Chairs and a table, those he recognized, of course, but he had never seen such magnificent ones, and a large wardrobe and a piece of furniture with drawers in it. It was not a writing table, a chest of drawers, perhaps, and everything was elaborately carved in designs of leaves and fruit and animals' heads. The window was wide and tall, and on both sides of it hung curtains of some thick material dyed with the same color as the leaves of an olive tree. David moved noiselessly about the room, examining everything closely, touching and returning to look again. There was a bowl on the table and two tall, slender objects that he pondered over deeply till he came to the conclusion that they must be candlesticks. They were shiny. Silver? Yes, they must be silver. 
David repeated the word slowly to himself, enjoying the sound of it. Silver was something very rich and fine. They looked like silver, at least from what David had learned about it. He glanced, his glance traveled upward. There was a picture, not the sort you saw posted on the outside walls of slopes and houses, but one that showed a beautiful scene. <clears throat> David stood on the bed and stretched up to see it better. It was a painting. He was sure of it. It was just like what the men in the camp had described to him. David sat down in bed quite overcome. If only he could remember it all. He had been so small when he had any knowledge had had any knowledge of what the world was like outside of the concentration camp, and Johannes had not liked the men to tell him much more about it. What the boy doesn't know, he won't miss, he would say. David had once heard him say that when they thought he had fallen asleep. They had always answered his questions, but they would leave it at that, and afterwards, when Johannes was dead, he had spoken to no one. He was lucky, therefore, to have learned at least something, and now it was up to him to remember all he could and keep his eyes open so that the children and their parents would not discover how little he really knew. He wondered whether he should stay where he was until someone came and said he might go downstairs, or should he just get up and go down? But his clothes were not there, and he could not walk around the house with nothing on. Before he had time to consider further, the door opened gently, and the children's mother peeped in. So you're awake, she said, smiling. I brought you some clothes in case you want to get up. You may stay in bed if you'd rather. Are your hands still painful? And your ankles, are they any worse? David answered that his ankles hurt most, but he was not in great pain anywhere and would like to get up. But they're not my clothes, he said, as he saw that the children's mother was laying across a chair. No, those are being washed. These are Andrea's, but I think they'll fit you. David looked at them anxiously. I might tear them on a branch, he said. My dear boy, she replied, and after all you've done for us. David wondered if he should explain that he had not rescued the little girl on their account, but entirely for his own sake in order to repay his debt to God. He decided not to, however. Perhaps she would not understand, and perhaps she did not know about his God to the green pastures and still waters. It was safer not to say much, for then he would avoid saying anything that might rouse their suspicions of him. He put the clothes on, or rather the children's mother helped him to, for they were very fine clothes with buttons and a thing called a zipper, which David was not at all sure how to manage. There were trousers, short brown ones like those the children had been wearing, and a shirt. Not one like his own, but a real shirt with buttons. It was green. There were stockings, too, and the kind of shoes called sandals. David had never tried wearing anything on his feet before, and there were pockets in the trousers. David stood quite still, and his eyes began to feel hot, as if he wanted to cry. He had never thought he would wear clothes like these, and he had an irrepressible desire to see what he looked like, to see what he looked like being an ordinary boy at last. The lady seemed to guess what was passing through his mind, for she opened the wardrobe door, and there on the inside was a large, full-length mirror. It was big enough for a boy to see himself from top to toe, or for a grown man come to that. David regarded himself critically. He did not think there was anything odd about what he saw. True, he did not have black hair, but otherwise he looked like any other boy who was not particularly fat, and he'd grown quite brown from being in the sun so much. Without thinking, he said, I look quite like an ordinary boy, don't I? Of course you do, she answered, but she did not sound as she altogether meant it. Then she added, and you look like a very handsome boy, and a brave one, too. Come, the children are impatient to see you, and you must be hungry. She walked so quickly that David could not see anything properly. He was aware that there was furniture everywhere and carpets and paintings, but he had no opportunity to see what they looked like. They descended a long, broad staircase and came to other rooms. One of them had a door that led out to the large garden, and there they found the children and their father. Maria was looking rather pale, but her father said she had insisted upon getting up and coming downstairs so that she could see David again. David found himself smiling once more as he looked at her. Drink your milk now, children, and then you can take David to play. But not too roughly, mind you. He must be careful of his burns. They said he would stay with them for a while. He should stay with them for a while, at any rate until his arms and legs were quite well again. He was welcome to stay even longer if he were not expected back with the circus immediately. David did not really know what he would rather do. He wanted to go, but at the same time he wanted to stay in order to learn all he could about the children's house. He looked up intently at the children's father and mother. They were both smiling. Can I go now, this very moment, if I want to? The children's father stopped smiling and looked disappointed. Yes, of course, David, if that's what you'd rather do. But we should all be very glad if you would stay with us for a while so that we could show you how grateful we are. David considered, if only if it were not too dangerous, he would like to stay with them a little and learn more about their way of life. If I can go whenever I want, then I'd like to stay for a bit, he said at length. Yes, thank you. I don't have to join the circus just yet, but please don't be so grateful, for you see, I wanted to rescue the little girl from the fire, and you've already thanked me. Yes, but we could, shall continue to be grateful to you for as long as we live, David. It's something we shall never forget, the children's father said quietly. David felt very, very tired that evening. He was asleep once more in that soft, cozy bed, and yet it was a long time before he fell asleep. So excited was he with all that he had seen that day. He could not remember even half of it. There was not room in his head 
for so many new impressions at once. But he did remember the food. Never would he forget what it was like to eat in such a house. It was almost like listening to music. Johannes had once told him about it, and when he saw it, he remembered. One of the prisoners had made some remark about eating like pigs, and so David had asked whether people ate differently outside the camp. But he had never been able to picture what it was like, and now he had seen for himself. You sat at a table covered with a cloth so white that it gleamed, and there were plates, one for each person, with flowers painted on them, and candlesticks with candles in them and flowers in a bowl. And with the glasses you drank from were fine and delicate and tinkled if you happened to touch them with a knife or a fork. And the knives and forks and spoons were all silver, and everyone had his own, as well as a napkin to wipe his fingers on should they become greasy. David was afraid he would not know how to eat properly, but he watched the children's father and mother first and then did as they did. It was lucky he was used to being careful in his movements, for otherwise he would have certainly spilled something. And there was more food than you could possibly eat at one time, all kinds of different things, and everything tasted wonderful. David dared not eat very much, for he knew the rich food might make him ill since he was not used to it. But to think of eating as, eating as something beautiful... Well, if that was how the prisoners in the concentration camp had been in the habit of eating, he could well understand why they said they ate like pigs there. The food was brought in by the servants and cleared away before the next course arrived, and you were given clean plates and knives and everything. And the children said they ate like that every day and several times a day. The next day, he would enjoy it all again. And that's the end of chapter four.